Today, in our lecture series uh, on harnessing artificial intelligence, we're going to be talking about supervised learning. In the last conversation we had last week, you heard about rule-based learning. And uh, our speaker was talking about making references to neural networks being able to do things that rule-based learning couldn't do. And a lot of you had questions about that. So today we have, our speaker today is going to give you an uh, overview of that topic, the neural networks, how we, what, why it's called supervised learning, and give you plenty of things you can chew on and think about. One of the common examples to illustrate the difference between the kind of uh, programming that we've been used to in computer science for many years, which is using programming languages, rules, and logic. There's certain things we have never figured out how to do with that, such as processing images. Can a machine distinguish a photo of a dog from a photo of a cat? Can a machine tell you which photos in your album include your mother's face? Can a machine spot a potential terrorist carrying a weapon? These are all things we'd like to do, but we've never been able to figure out how to get a rule-based program to do them. On the other hand, we have been able to figure out how to get this thing called a neural network to do these kind of things. So today's speaker is going to talk to you about how neural networks work and um, <clears throat> what's made the transformation that enabled these things to become so useful in the last 10 or 15 years. At the beginning of computer science, there were people talking about neural networks as a way to build computers. But unfortunately, they, they were slow compared to the way that people, the engineers were actually building computers. And then they didn't make the cut for computer architecture at that time. Since that time, there's been some amazing advances in supercomputing which allow these networks to be trained and they're now doing some astonishing feats. Well, that, that's the subject here. This is Professor Marco Oriskanen who's here today to talk to you on this topic. He's going to show you how neural networks work and towards the end he's going to show you that neural networks have a kind of a dark side too which is really interesting actually because some neural networks are subject to attacks by people who want to cause them to malfunction. And that means if you're going to be using neural networks in any kind of critical application ranging from driving a car to controlling a weapon system, you don't want somebody to be able to attack your network and make it malfunction. Marco just joined our faculty after almost a decade of commercial experience which uh, is with uh, artificial intelligence and data capabilities working for the Bose Corporation. He's developed deep learning models and machine learning algorithms that are now deployed in millions of devices. And he holds several packet, patents. He's published uh, in numerous uh, times and he's developed products in radars, satellites, cameras, acoustic speech and other sensor technologies. He received his PhD recently, well what, what about 10 years ago now, right? <laughs> about 10 years, recently at, uh, from University of Illinois. So I introduce you to Marco Oriskanen, please welcome him. Thank it's you all yours. for introduction. Hello everyone, welcome to my talk. And as Peter has hinted, I will talk about supervised learning today. And uh, I will first try to provide an introduction to what is the supervised learning framework. Uh, I will talk a little bit about classical machine learning approaches. And then I will expand and really talk about neural networks and deep learning as the modern approach to supervised learning. Now, what is supervised learning? I, I will start by giving you two examples. So uh, I'll start with the visual recognition task. So let's say uh, you, you have a system to which you can present an image of a cat or an image of a dog. 
and you would like that system to classify each of the images as cat or a dog. So there'll be one, so that, that's an example of a classification task. Now, I will move onward and provide you a different type of an example. This looks like something from an Excel spreadsheet, right? So uh, this is a different type of data. So this data comes from a very famous data set, which is called Boston Housing Prices. Uh, in this data set, in order to orient you a little bit, uh, each row represent a you know, set of values coming from a specific neighborhood in Boston. Some of the values in columns captured are the average number of, number of rooms uh, in the column RM. And in the last column, for instance, you can have a price, you know, or is the price uh, for that specific row. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out here is that in the previous example, we, we were trying to classify things. So the example was discrete. It was a cat or a dog. In this case here, we have a non-discrete values. Uh, we, we're, we have a values that can be 21.6 or 34.7. Uh, and the typical question that one would ask would be, can we predict the value of the house based on the average, of, average number of rooms per dwelling? So this is so-called a regression task. Or now, I will move forward and try to give you a more formal definition of supervised learning. So what we're really trying to do in, within this framework is to learn mapping between the pairs of x and y, where x in this case represents a set in which we have images of cats and dogs. And we're trying to learn a mapping function between that input and an output that represents categorical variables or labels of those images. So we have cats and dogs, that other set. And the function f of x is the mapping function that we're trying to learn. Now, how does the supervised learning framework look in practice? So the way that you would start is you, you would have a training data set with a lot of images. And you need to remember that when you talk about images, the features in images are pixels. You know, these days with modern cell phones, these images would have up to 12 megapixels uh, in them. So that's a huge space of input features. In classical approach, uh, we humans learn how to take an image and through careful crafting of mathematical representations of that image, develop something which is called, which are called image features, which is a way of compressing those 12 million megapixels into something that's a more meaningful representation to train a algorithm on. We would then, upon extracting those image features from images, uh, go into a training block which would have access to training labels. Remember, we know the label of each image which is being passed in. And by being in the training block, iterating for many, many times, we would learn that transfer function or mapping function from x to y, uh, which will be called a learned model. Now, once we learn a model, uh, we, we have finished with the training phase. And then we can move to a testing phase, or also called an inference phase, in which we provide a new example for which we don't know the label. And for that same example, we would go through the same set of transformations to extract image features. We would apply a learned model, and we would get an output prediction. In this case, the prediction would be a class. Uh, is it a dog or a cat? And in this, uh, in this example, the correct class would be dog. Now, to capture what I've talked about, you know, there are two types of problems that we would address with supervised learning. So one set of problems is a classification, which is discrete. And on the right-hand side, you can see an example that we're really trying to design a classifier to separate two discrete classes as a cat or a dog. And then another set of 
problems that we can address with supervised learning is regression, where we're trying to estimate a continuous variable, meaning we're trying to predict a house price from some features in our data set. Now, I said I will briefly talk about classical machine learning algorithms. Now, I've captured some of them here in the, on the left-hand side in a blue box. I will not go too much into details about them. I will try to state a couple of useful facts about them. Uh, one of them is that uh, you know, these algorithms require human <coughs> experts to engineer features. So that is something that deep learning has addressed and we will go into that in following slides. Uh, but that can be an obstacle, uh, that can be an obstacle for uh, many applications, either not having available human experts that can handcraft features, uh, or we might not have a full understanding of the physics or, or the relationships to extract meaningful features that we can train classifiers on. However, one of the big advantages of classical machine learning algorithms is that they can sometimes be effective on smaller data sets. Uh, and you will understand uh, what I mean by that as we move forward when we start talking about neural networks and what are some of the requirements in order to train a neural network. So what is deep learning? I mentioned previously that you know, we will talk about deep learning in neural networks and that deep learning has started this uh, whole revolution recently with AI. So I will start by capturing again what we talked about classical machine learning. So in this illustration on the, on the upper part, uh, you know, I will start on the left hand side. This is an example of binary classification. We're trying to classify if on an input we, you know, we, we provide a, a picture, you know, image of a car, and we want a system that will tell us on an output if it's a car or not a car, right? So in a, in a classical machine learning approach, uh, we would have an expert, you know, design feature extraction algorithms. Uh, we would go through feature extraction. We would then train a classifier best suited out of that list of classifiers. We might try even few of those. And then the best performing classifier would be applied in this typical fashion and would provide us an answer. Is it a car or not a car? In deep learning, in contrast to that, uh, one would provide an input and then here we have a graph of typical representation of a neural network. You probably have, if, if you ever Googled or looked for neural networks, this is one of the typical in introductory graphics of how does the neural network look like. But what you need to understand here is that you have mathematical description of what I would call, a, you know, what is a neuron. So you have these nodes that are mathematical neurons. They are connected through weights, which are labeled as W. And that model can do jointly both the feature extraction and classification from this data set. So that's in contrast to humans designing feature extraction. So that was one of the big advantages of the neural networks over the classical machine learning algorithms. And then it would give us an output. The other advantage is that they, you know, deep learning and uh, neural networks outperform, uh, uh, you know, at this point, any, any type of classical machine learning algorithm. And that's the reason for the explosion and adoption of these models. Now, since I mentioned neural networks, I will, and I mentioned uh, mathematical neuron, I wanted at least to give just a brief background, where do they come from? So they, they first, you know, neural networks first emerged in the 60s. So it, it, it's an old theory. Mathematically, it's been around for a long time. Uh, in 2010s, they started achieving human-like performance on many tasks, uh, especially in vision recognition-based tasks. Now here on the, on the left-hand side at the bottom, uh, this is an image of biological neuron. And uh, what humans and mathematicians noticed, you know, with this bio-inspired approach was that, you know, neuron has some input signals, 
it will apply some nonlinear transformation to those signals and provide some output signals on its end. Mathematical neuron tries to follow that formalism. It will receive some input signals. It would apply some weights to them. It would have an activation function that provides that nonlinearity. And it provides an output you know, that is nonlinear uh, in mapping relative to the input x. And that is a simple comparison between the two. The biological neuron is by far more complex and more capable than mathematical description, but this is how we approached uh, in this type of modeling, you know, modeling the biological neuron. Now, how do we train neural networks? As you've seen, the neural networks are built of layers of mathematical neurons, as I've shown you previously. And that is just one type of architecture. There are different types of architectures, and I will talk about one more type of architecture later in this talk. But if we focus on this, uh, what is called also a multi-layer perceptron network, uh, you've seen that it was built from multiple layers. So here I have three layers with parameters omega. And on the left-hand side, uh, I provide as an input, so x represents our input features. If you remember, we use cats and dogs, and we can use that here as an example. So we provide images of cats and dogs on an input. Y represents the correct label. And then in a process of training, uh, we in what's called the forward propagation, we would take an image of a cat or a dog, we would propagate it through all of these layers. And when I say propagate it, that means that we would apply a mathematical function of these three layers on X in order to map it into Y hat, which is an estimate of a label due to that mathematical transformation. We would compare that estimate with the true label that we knew to calculate an error. Error tells us how far are we from the truth. And then based on the magnitude of that error in a backward propagation fashion, uh, we would update the weights omega in each of the layers. And we do this iteratively many, many times. And by doing so, over time, our error starts going to zero. So we're getting more and more accurate if we're having successful training on our model. Now, I mentioned that we will talk about other architectures. So uh, one other fancy architecture, it's called convolutional neural network. Uh, an abbreviation is CNN. Those are highly complex architectures. In the next slide, I will show you a more simplistic version of that type of architecture. But here I wanted to show you what do, what do these models learn? Right, so uh, in this example, this is a phase detection example. Uh, on an input to a convolutional neural network, we would provide a phase that we're trying to detect. So associate correct, correct label that this person is, for instance, Jane Doe. And what neural network learns in its lower layers are these very uh, like kind of this hierarchical features. And these are very simple features. It just learns some edges. It learns how to recognize the edges and blobs. And these are very simple features. As you move through the network, it, it moves in complexity and it learns uh, in higher levels uh, how to detect uh, eyes or mouth or a nose, where when you get close to the end where you're doing classification, it can already put everything together into faces. And in the end, it will know how to detect a correct face. Now, this type of an architecture uh, was introduced in, for instance, by uh, this man, Lacoon, in 1998. And he was focused on a problem of detecting handwritten digits and letters. And uh, you know, he provided, in a way, a blueprint 
of how would you build a neural network using these convolutional layers and train it in order to be successful on that task. Now, I, I used a very older architecture because I wanted to emphasize a couple of things. So one of the things that I wanted to ask, emphasize on an input, you know, we're providing a very small image. So we're providing something that has 32 by 32 pixels. If you remember from modern cameras, we get 12 megapixels, uh, you know, size of images. Uh, so he, you know, we, we start with something that's small, and then we use this convolutional layers. And what convolutions are, are, uh, you know, the easiest to explain them, they're mathematical operations. They will apply another type of mapping function to sub-regions of an image and be able to, over time, compress that image into a very small set of meaningful features. So you will go from something that's 32 by 32 to in the, you know, some of these last layers to something that's 5 by 5 in dimension. On top of it, you also need to add uh, fully, uh, you also need to add multi-layer perceptrons. So you would add one or two layers of just neuron, fully connected neurons. And on the output, uh, you would have the, the number of neurons equal to the number of your classes. Uh, what's interesting about this is that in 1998, this type of network had 60,000 parameters. Uh, these days, to, you know, modern architectures have anywhere from 100,000 to more than 100 million parameters in training. So, we'll, you know, one of the aspects here to be mindful of is what is the interpretability of these type of models? And also, how do you train something that it's so big? So what is an output from a neural network? So here I will use uh, an example of uh, image of Admiral Case Hopper. And uh, we will walk through image classification and what would be an output from neural network on this image. So uh, an output from a neural network depends on your task and model. In this case, we will focus on convolutional neural network trained for classification. Uh, for that type of a problem, uh, the output from a neural network is a probability of a class label. So as I said previously, you know, the output from a neural network had, had, the, 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 had the same number of neurons as the classes that you had, and each class gets assigned a probability and the maximum probability uh, determines the class on an output from a model. Uh, in this example, I use ResNet50. That was pre-trained on an ImageNet. So ResNet50 is this very large, 50-layer uh, deep neural network. And ImageNet is a data set that has about 10 to 14 million examples for training. And it has about 1,000 classes that this neural network classifier was trained on. Now, in order to apply this model to an image, uh, these modern networks still cap the size of an input image. So the, this model will accept only sizes of 224 by 224 pixels time three channels. So that's still much, much smaller than the 12 megapixel image that you get from your cell phone these days. Now when I apply this model to, to the image, I will get an output as a military uniform uh, with uh, 0.7 probability that that's the class. And this is an existing class, so I was, I was lucky in that sense that neural network could recognize this image. Now what happens if I provide the neural network an image from a non-existing class uh, in training. And in that case, you know, here I'm providing an uh, extension cord. Uh, and neural network will give me the output of a label with highest probability. And that's a combination lock. 
So this is one thing to be mindful of. Your, your neural network you know, classifier will always give you an answer, regardless if it's right or wrong. It, it doesn't understand context. It understands math and probabilities, and it will always provide you an output for a classical neural network that, that we talked about. Now, some other challenges that can, you know, I, I would say that, you know, why is deep learning on the rise? I, I'll leave the challenges for later. Uh, is that uh, a few years ago, someone noticed that a single layer of mathematical neuron could be described by a matrix multiplication applied to its input vector. You know, graphics chips, GPUs are really good at such matrix calculations. And really the explosion of GPUs happened before because of the gamers. So thank you gamers for advancing <laughs> the science. Uh, the next aspect is that uh, GPU supercomputers can run millions of photos through CNN and train the network with 100 million parameters in a few hours. So for instance, the model that I use, the Tresnet 50, I, I think it, it trains in two hours on, uh, I think it's like eight GPUs, some benchmarks that I've seen. I might be wrong about the numbers, but uh, they, they will run and you know, very quickly be trained. Uh, what's amazing about neural networks is that once trained, the GPU-powered network can label an image in milliseconds. So the training tanks takes a long time, and it's very costly. But the inference or testing on a new image, it just takes milliseconds. It's, it's instantaneous in your eyes. So now, what are some challenges of deep learning? Well, size of training data set is enormous. As, as we talked about, something that, has, uh, that can have millions of parameters requires millions of training examples in order to train a model. Uh, and you know, as, you know, challenges also associated with such huge data sets are how do you label huge quantities of data. You know, do you label them manually, right? That, that very quickly becomes laborious, but it's also a highly profitable business these days in the Silicon Valley where there are numerous startups uh, really working on data labeling, especially for autonomous driving. Do you use another machine, for instance, in IoT space, you could have sensors that can help you label data, also including, you know, you can also have health records, electronic records. There are, there are ways that data can be also labeled by non-human. And it also brings an issue of untrustworthy training data sets. How do you know if you can trust your data set? Uh, and I will try to address one aspect of that later on with slides of what can happen if, uh, you know, you have a, if the, if the data set is not trustworthy. There is also bias in training data, uh, depending on uh, how your data set was curated. Uh, Facebook recently, I think Facebook probably had the biggest flop uh, with racial bias in their face detection algorithm on Facebook. So there was a lot in the news. Uh, other types of biases could include you know, gender, ethnicity. There are some financial implications with respect to applying for loans. You know, will, will, will machine learning algorithms be biased against you getting a loan based on your previous history? And you know, there's also an issue of interpretability. We said that these models are big, so if you have something that has 100 million parameters, how do you explain them? Uh, especially if you think about uh, you know, simpler model like in finances, people use regression with one or two parameters. It's much easier to explain something that has two parameters than 100 million parameters. And then I'll jump into what are deep learning technologies. So in recent years, there has been an explosion of providers of deep learning technologies. Uh, kind of the, you know, the Google is really driving a lot of that progress with their TensorFlow framework. Uh, 
pot, you know, Torch, for instance, is Facebook's, MXNet is uh, Amazon's. Uh, Python is the language of modern machine learning. There are other frameworks. Uh, there are, I, I would say that almost monthly, there are new developments in this space. That's how quickly market is moving. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about untrustworthy data sets and what can happen if you have an adversary that's trying to attack your neural network model. Now, it is well known that adversary craft, you know, crafted or created small perturbations on inputs can degrade performance of neural networks. And uh, this is really well understood in digital space and it can happen both in inference and in training. In training would mean that somebody can, in, in, I think in simplest explanation, watermark your data. For instance, they could embed something in your images such that when you train your neural network with that data, it, you, know, they can, you expose vulnerabilities to the adversary that they can exploit in future. In inference, if somebody has access to your model and they can craft an example, they, they can craft an example that can make your model misclassified. So let me show you an example of that. So I've picked up an image of a tank, right? And I, and I ran it through the same model that ResNet 50 that we used on an image of Admiral Grace Hopper, right? And in, in this case, the network would say that yeah, that's a tank with 99% confidence. 0 0.99 is the probability. So, because tank has very strong features, it's really hard to mistake it for anything else if you look at it. However, uh, if I would craft an adversarial example, so I had access to the model, I was able to craft perturbations that I added to the original image. And when I ran that image again through a model, I got a different answer. I got an answer that the answer is a tow truck. Right, so that's one way of exploiting vulnerabilities in neural networks through these perturbations. Uh, this can become, you know, this can quickly become something very critical for naval operations, especially if you have, uh, you know, some systems that are automatically labeling examples uh, and deciding do you pass something to an analyst or not you can quickly trick that system and not see something that an analyst should have seen, for instance. Now, this was an example of an attack in a digital space, right, because images were already captured, and I was able to then manipulate the model. I was able to manipulate the images. I had access to a model. I could run it, and I could trick the model. However, these attacks are also possible in physical space. So they're not only limited to digital space. There were a couple of pieces of work recently in literature that demonstrate that. On the left hand side, for instance, this is an example of a physical attack on an environment where researchers managed to craft an attack that looks like, almost like a graffiti, but those are pieces of tape put on a stop sign. And in this case, they managed to uh, attack a neural network model that was trying to recognize road signs and instead of seeing a stop sign it saw a speed limit sign. So they are feasible in physical space. On the right hand side uh, this was a, a researcher managed by designing sunglasses, or glasses, not sunglasses in this case, uh, to attack a face recognition model uh, to be seen as a different person. So that has real implications, you know, for facial recognition models. Uh, as you know, a lot of cities, uh, especially London, is known for that. You know, their CCTV system tracks a lot of things. This is one way to not get detected in a crowd. Now, AI is everywhere these days. So I, I've given you uh, an overview of supervised learning, but this really starts stating, okay, so 
why is there explosion of AI and why is supervised learning so widely adopted? It's because it has a lot of commercial success at this point. So the AI is really everywhere. It's in speech recognition, image recognition, object localization, gesture recognition. It's, it's deployed both in cloud and on devices. Uh, in, on, on devices, you know, the, the architectures are similar, but they're more optimized for limited power-based device deployment. Uh, in the cloud, uh, there might be less optimization with bigger models. Uh, there are also different architectures used, for instance, for <coughs> translation and text classification and keyword spotting, this NLP type of tasks. People would use uh, what are called uh, recurrent neural networks. So that's a different family of, of neural networks and different layers compared to the ones that we addressed in this lecture. And I, I think with this slide, I'm, I'm really concluding my talk and I'm open to questions from the audience at this point. 